Chapter 12, Syra and the Sea. When we all got to school that first Monday of the second term, it turned out that nearly everyone had heard of Ahmed's story. It had spread over the holiday more quickly than news of a new flavoured packet of crisps, and just as quickly as he had become famous for being the boy that beat Brendan the bully, Ahmed became famous for being that refugee boy. I don't think anyone kept their promise to Mrs Khan of not asking him any questions because everyone in class tried to sneak in at least one whenever they talked to him. Even Josie and Michael and Tom couldn't help themselves and started to ask him things like, did you have cheese sandwiches in Syria? Or what was the weather like in Greece? Or did you ever eat snails and frogs in France? I don't think Ahmed minded because we were his friends. If he understood the question, he would just answer yes or no. And if he didn't understand, he would just stare at us or shrug. But there were lots of people he didn't know, asking him lots of questions too. Some of them asked him so many questions in one go that even we couldn't understand what they were saying and we could speak English. Some classes even began to send messengers to see if they could find anything out. Messengers are usually the smallest kids in their class and are paid in sweets or football stickers or extra lunch tokens to get information. Some of them are okay and leave you alone if you tell them that you don't want to say anything. But the ones that work for the school bullies are especially annoying. It's not their fault really because they get beaten up if they go back with nothing new to tell. But sometimes they won't listen to you even after you've already given them an answer. The most annoying messenger in school is Victor. Victor's extra skinny even though he eats chips every day and he has a gold earring in his ear. He works for two upper school bullies whose names I don't know but who always hang around the lower boys toilets and shake anyone that goes in until everything falls out of their pockets. But he also works for a group of girls who always stand around the water fountains, so you never really know who he's messengering for. After everyone had found out Ahmed was a refugee, Victor followed us around for nearly a whole week, at break time, at lunch time, and even at home times. He would suddenly appear and ask lots of questions that even I found strange, like, where did you get your shoes from? Are you scared of fireworks? Can you make a tent from a shirt? And are you really nine or are you secretly older? He got so annoying that even the break duty teachers began to notice and told him to leave Ahmed alone, except Mr Irons. He was the only teacher who didn't say anything. After he got told off by Mrs Sanders and Miss Hempsey one break, Victor stayed away, but his question stayed with us. Sometimes words hang around longer than people, even when you don't want them, too. And whenever I was on my own, or just with Tom and Josie and Michael, Victor's questions would pop up into my head and make me wonder what they meant. The only thing that was even more annoying than the messengers was Brendan the bully, because instead of being nicer to Ahmed after seeing his pictures and hearing his story, Brendan the bully became even more horrible. He seemed to have forgotten that Ahmed can turn into a lion and punch him hundreds of times because he began to whisper, Oi! Smelly refugee bag! whenever he saw him, and in class he would throw spitballs whenever Mrs Khan or Miss Hempsey weren't looking. When we told Ahmed to tell Mrs Khan or Mr Sanders about it, he shook his head and said, I'm not scared. Lots of bad people in camps. My dad say I fight them, so I fight him. When Ahmed said this, I thought he was very brave, so on Halloween, I brought in one of my favourite Tintin books for him to look at because in it, Tintin stays and fights lots of bad guys even though the bad guys are bigger and there are lots more of them. There are always lots more of them. See, you, you're like this. See, I said showing him the book. I was dressed as a vampire and Ahmed was dressed as a green monster although Tom said it was the Hulk. We were sitting in the playground on our own because Tom and Josie and Michael were still eating their lunch and taking too long. Tintin, he cried out when he saw the cover. You know Tintin, I asked, surprised. I hadn't thought about it before because I guess Tintin really is, a, is famous anywhere. Yes, said Ahmed. 
I read all time. My dad, he read them to me. I nodded, remembering the voices my dad used to make when he read the, the comics to me too. After a while, I said, I have all of them. You can see them if you like. I keep this? asked Ahmed. Oh, I said, I hadn't really meant to give him the book. I had only wanted to show it to him, but I knew I could ask Mum to find me another old copy in the library and save it for me when it was about to be thrown away. So I shrugged and said, sure. Ahmed gave me a big smile and started to flick through it. He stopped at the page and pointed at Captain Haddock. My dad, he had this, he said, pointing. He said, moving his finger so that it pointed to Captain Haddock's beard. You? I shook my head. No, my dad didn't have a beard. But also, my dad, he's dead. Ahmed nodded sadly and looked down at the picture. I don't know where is dad. Maybe he dead too. I looked over at Ahmed. He's not here in London, I asked. Ahmed shook his head. I come here? My dad, he behind? I frowned. Behind? Where? Ahmed shrugged and looked down at the comic. Maybe he in France. Oh, I said, feeling sad for him. I'd hate it if I didn't know where my dad was or if he was still alive. I wanted to ask him who the lady in the red scarf was and whether she could help him find his dad and where his mum and sister and his cat were. But then Ahmed flicked to another page and held it to me. He was pointing to a picture. In it, Tintin and Captain Haddock and Snowy and a man with an eye patch were all standing on a raft in the middle of the ocean and Captain Haddock was waving a flag that had been made out of his blue jumper. See, said Ahmed quietly. I nodded. I have sister, he said. She there now. You mean here? I asked, pointing to the raft. No, said Ahmed. Here, he pointed to the ocean. And then I understood. Oh, I said. I felt strange as if something had just hit me on the inside of my chest. It was the same feeling I had in the hospital when Mum and Uncle Lenny told me that Dad had died. You mean your sister? Her name? Syra, said Ahmed. Syra? She is in the sea? Ahmed nodded and rubbed his eye. Then she's not with your cat? I asked quietly. Ahmed shook his head. Cat dead in mountains. And then flicked to another page. He pointed to a tent and said, Mum, sick. Last time I see her. Oh, I said. I wanted to cry, but Ahmed wasn't crying, so I didn't think I should either. Instead, I stared at the picture he was pointing to just as hard as I could so that he couldn't see my eyes. We didn't say anything else after that because a few seconds later, Michael and Josie came out and joined us. Tom was still inside because it was chocolate pudding day and he always tried to get an extra piece after everyone else had left. I waited to see if Ahmed would show them the pictures and tell them about Syra and the sea and his mum too, but he didn't. And when he looked at me and shook his head, I knew he wanted me to keep it a secret. I nodded back and made a silent promise to Ahmed that I wouldn't tell anyone, but I didn't know that I would be forced to break my promise the very next day because that was when I heard something and it was a something so scary that it changed everything.